Hey, all right. Welcome, gang, to some Civil War poetry. My name is Vincent Hannum, and this is my office in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We are live, 7.30 a.m. July the 2nd, 2020. Just looking at my, uh, getting the lay of the land here in the chat. Anyone joining us? Doesn't look like it. <laughs> That's all right. I release these uh, in the afternoon on uh, on Facebook. Anyways, if you're friends with me there. Um, okay, we might have somebody tuning in, but nobody in the chat. So I haven't figured this quite all out yet, but that's all right. Uh, <clears throat> so just a couple things. Wanted to say that uh, looks like these videos so far have been 16 minutes long, which is great. That's fine if we want it to be that way. Um, today, I'm really just going to dive in. I have all my bookmarks, I have all my tabs up, so we're not going to waste any time uh, watching me just flip through pages. So, uh, so yeah, I say this time, let's dive on in. So, all right, all right, all right. It is July the 2nd. Yesterday on July the 1st, on this day in history, we saw that the Battle of Gettysburg began in 1863. Today, following that journey, July the 2nd, Union Colonel Strong Vincent was mortally wounded at Little Round Top. He died on July 7th from his wounds. Again, just highlighting, I'm not an expert. I don't know who Strong Vincent is. I probably should. We share a name. Um, but he was killed at Little Round Top, which was a famous uh, aspect of the Battle of Gettysburg. So there you go. If anyone is interested in some more Civil War literature, uh, I would highly recommend The Killer Angels by Jeff Shera. Uh, that book, uh, it's uh, historical fiction, so... Uh, it really kind of puts you in the Battle of Gettysburg. And yeah, I would definitely recommend that book. His son, Michael Shera, has a huge uh, line of historical fiction novels as well. Um, I could be getting those names mixed up, <laughs> but I think it's Jeff Shera, The Killer Angels. So now that we are on the topic of literature, poetry of the Civil War. If you're just tuning in, I'll give the same spiel every morning. Uh, this book is uh, split into two parts, one the blue and one the gray. Uh, each uh, is going to deal with poems written from um, loyalists and sympathizers uh, from either side. They, were, they are contemporary poems of the day. Uh, the earliest are from just like right before the war started, and the later ones are some decades after, but it's been really interesting just to hear uh, authors of the day and their take on it. It's really funny in the beginning, we've uh, read some really romantic sweeping poems like we're off to war. We're going to, you know, bring the rebels back into the fold. Um, and as we go on, I anticipate the poems to grow a little darker, a little uh, less grand in their romanticism and just be like oh yeah war sucks our country's falling apart everyone's dying gotta help us so this is episode three we will uh get started and what i like to do now is uh read the bios of the authors we covered yesterday so maybe that'll get you tuning in uh but uh, so yesterday we read two poems, one by Oliver Wendell Holmes, the other by Anonymous. So no bio there. Spoiler alert. But Oliver Wendell Holmes, it's a name I know, I will admit, <laughs> uh, who he is, not sure. This is the, the senior. eighteen o nine to eighteen ninety four was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and educated in Andover, Boston, and Paris. 
Although a prominent physician and professor of anatomy, he achieved greater fame as a poet of national prominence. His son, Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., served in the 20th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. Okay. I was wondering which one was the was the justice senior uh junior senior was a poet junior was a justice so today's blue poem is called all quiet along the potomac all quiet along the potomac they say except now and then a stray picket is shot as he walks on his beat to and fro by a rifleman hid in the thicket. Tis nothing, a private or two now and then will not count in the news of the battle. Not an officer lost, not only one, not, uh, only one of the men moaning out all alone the death rattle. All quiet along the Potomac tonight, where the soldiers lie peacefully dreaming. Their tents in the rays of the clear autumn moon or the light of the watchfire are gleaming. A tremulous sigh of the gentle night wind through the forest leaves softly is creeping, while stars up above with their glittering eyes keep guard for the army is sleeping. There's only the sound of the lone sentry's tread as he tramps from the rock to the fountain and thinks of the two in the low trundle bed far away in the cot on the mountain. His musket falls slack, his face dark and grim grows gentle with memories tender as he mutters a prayer for the children asleep for their mother. May heaven defend her. The moon seems to shine just as brightly as then, that night when the love yet unspoken leaped up to his lips when low-murmured vows were pledged to be ever unbroken. Then drawing his sleeve roughly over his eyes, he dashes off tears that are welling and gathers his gun closer up to its place as if to keep down the heart swelling. He passes the fountain, the blasted pine tree. The footstep is lagging and weary, yet onward he goes through the broad belt of light toward the shade of the forest so dreary. Hark! Was it the night wind that rustled the leaves? Was it moonlight so wondrously flashing? It looked like a rifle. Ha! <laughs> Mary, goodbye. The red lifeblood is ebbing and plashing. All quiet along the Potomac tonight. No sound save the rush of the river, while soft falls the dew on the face of the dead. The pickets off duty forever. That was All Quiet Along the Potomac by Ethel Lynn Beers. So already I can see that this is moving into a less romantic aspect. Um, Ethel Lynn Beers has uh, portrayed a, uh, a ninth century guard, the picket. And why are we quiet along the Potomac tonight? Because the life, sorry, the red lifeblood is ebbing and plashing. move on to the gray now. This is a poem called Carolina. The despot travels thy sacred sands. Thy pines give shelter to his bands. Thy sons stand by with idle hands. Carolina. He breathes at ease thy airs of balm. He scorns the lances of thy palm. Oh, who shall break thy craven calm, Carolina? Thy ancient fame is growing dim. A spot is on thy garment's rim. Give to the winds thy battle hymn, Carolina. Call thy children of the hill. Wake swamp and river, coast and rill. Rouse all thy strength and all thy skill, Carolina. Cite wealth and science, trade and art, Touch with thy fire the cautious mart, and pour thee through the people's heart, Carolina. Till even the coward spurns his fears, and all thy fields and fens and mirrors shall bristle like thy palm with spears, 
Carolina. Hold up the glories of thy dead. Say how thy elder children bled and point to Utah's battle bed, Carolina. Tell how the patriot's soul was tried and what his dauntless breast defied, how Rutledge ruled and Lawrence died, Carolina. Cry till thy summons, heard at last, shall fall like Marion's bugle blast, re-echoed from the haunted past, Carolina. I hear a murmur as of waves that grope their way through sunless caves, like bodies struggling in their graves, Carolina. And now it deepens, slow and grand, it swells as rolling to the land, an ocean broke upon the strand, Carolina. Shout, let it reach the startled Huns, and roar with all thy festal guns. It is the answer of thy sons, Carolina. They will not wait to hear thee call, from Sacum's head to Sumter's hall. Resounds the voice of hut and hall, Carolina. No, thou hast not a stain, they say, or none save what the battle day shall wash in seas of blood away. Carolina. Thy skirts indeed the foe may part, thy robe be pierced with sword and dart, they shall not touch thy noble heart, Carolina. Ere thou shalt own the tyrant's thrall, ten times ten thousand men must fall, thy corpse may hearken to his call, Carolina. When by thy beer, in mournful throngs, the women chant thy mortal wrongs. Twill be their own funeral songs, Carolina. From thy dead breast, by ruffians trod, no helpless child shall look to God. All, all shall be safe beneath thy sod, Carolina. Girt with such wills, do girt with such wills to dare and bear. Assured in right and mailed in prayer, thou wilt not bow thee to despair, Carolina. Throw thy bold banner to the breeze, front with thy ranks the threatening seas, like thine own proud armorial trees, Carolina. Fling down thy gauntlet to the Huns, and roar the challenge from thy guns. Then leave the future to thy sons, Carolina. And that was by Henry Timrod. And my knee-jerk impression is that he, here's my guess, he's from Carolina. We'll find out in tomorrow's bio. Uh, south, North or South, I'm going to say South Carolina. Um, again, that still seems to me a very rousing uh, text. Like, let's go get... The Hun, which he mentioned twice, which is uh, what I believe to be Germanic people. So I don't quite understand that. In fact, there were a lot of references in there. I probably either mispronounced, uh, certainly didn't understand. So again, any poetry buffs or English teachers out there, uh, let me know. Uh, so that's going to conclude it for this morning. Just wanted to say uh, I may not be here tomorrow. I'm take, uh, I have the day off of work. Uh, so still playing that one by ear. If I don't see you tomorrow, happy 4th of July, happy Independence Day, and I will definitely see you on Monday morning. This is some Civil War. Like, comment, subscribe, do all that fun things, and let me know if there's some features or elements uh, you'd like me to incorporate. Uh, but again, what do you know? We're running on 16 minutes, so uh, so long, everybody. <laughs>